In this week's roundup, we start with Hogwarts Legacy being the best selling game on PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC before it's even launched. Over on Steam here, top of the charts has been for quite a while, even outselling various different free to play games. And with it being released in a couple of days for early access or on the 10th for full release, a lot of people are looking forward to it, especially after the gameplay reveal that we had a few days ago. Although with any success comes its detractors, and Hogwarts Legacy has been an extremely controversial title. And I think the first thing that comes to mind when you say Hogwarts and controversial is obviously Elden Ring players bragging that they've got more spells than Hogwarts Legacy does, when Hogwarts Legacy is solely based around magic and wizards. A number of fans have been arguing with an Elden Ring meme account after the number of spells was revealed in each game. They were complaining that Hogwarts Legacy will only feature 26 spells, while Elden Ring players get 171, resorting to quality over quantity defenses. Given that a lot of Elden Ring spells are personal buffs, and you'd be like, yeah, okay, but that still does show that Elden Ring has a wider variety of builds, and I think it's a fair criticism when your entire game is based around magic. Now, they do say that not many spells are actually introduced in the Harry Potter franchise, but I don't know, you could go and sort of consult the author for things that could be added in. However, we all know that's a touchy subject and comes with problems of its own, which may be why various different groups have decided to just ban conversation about the game altogether. We've got the Hogwarts Legacy subreddit, which have just banned any conversation about the author at all. You know, she's not important. She just invented the franchise. Why would anyone need to mention her name? Especially when they say they go so far as to ban people who are even talking about the game if they even mention the author herself. Apparently, that's somehow making conversations off topic. I don't know, to me, it just looks like you've lost your mind if you can't even mention the author's name of the franchise you're supposed to be enjoying. Although that's not the furthest that people have gone. When over on Reset Era, they entirely banned promotional material for the game altogether, <laughs> and have actually expanded their ban on promotion to no discussion about the game at all. So welcome to the logical endpoint of just not allowing people to play a game that might be fun the complete and utter destruction of any conversation even remotely related to it. Oh, 2023, you are off to a great start. Now, James Gunn has recently revealed his DCU Chapter 1 for movies, television, and games, where everything is going to be one massive tied-in universe, all of the actors from the movies being in the animations and the games. And this has come under fire. Not just from angles you'd expect after the firing of Henry Cavill as Superman, but from people like Marvel's Midnight Sun director who called the plans a nightmare for gaming crossovers. Games and films are very different beasts. He says, I understand the desire, but the pressure that this puts on amazing voice actors, these are different universes and that's how they should and will stay. Now they come out with a gun quote and say, oh, it won't actually be that much pressure because it's not as if we're all going to have all this stuff at the same time. They're not going to have massive workloads. We'll have a movie come out and then two years later, we might have another movie coming out and in the middle, we can have a game but I don't think it's actually workload that he's talking about. I think what he actually means is what a Batman Arkham dev has also criticized him for, because this is someone who says he will never work for DC games again if they do this. Because he says these writers and voice actors do a hundred versions of everything. They're in the booth doing 600 lines of dialogue to end up with 20 of the best. Do you really think you're going to get Robert Patterson to outwork a voice actor on a budget that makes sense? And that, to me, is the strongest argument. Off, oh, there's one thing that we are well aware of. It is the ego of a Hollywood actor. They think everything is all about them. And the last thing they're going to do is sit in there for hours doing hundreds of lines to get one take and move on to the next. They're going to want millions upon millions for that. And that's even if you assume that the skill set is easily transferable. Sure, you can be in a movie on screen, but putting all of that emotion and everything else straight into your voice, that's an entirely different beast. You also have the fact that a voice actor generally has lots of different voices, and they can do multiple characters all at the same time, and it can all be built into the same price. But now you want an entire Hollywood cast to all transfer their characters over to the game? You're either going to have to compromise on the characters that you can have in the game, or it's just not going to work. And with the sheer amount of crunch and delays that we already get in gaming, combined with how we expect repeated content in the future, I just don't see how it's possible. Okay, so you get this major movie star to come over and start working on the game. Great. What happens in a few months when he's got to come back for an expansion pack? Is he going to do that as well? Is he going to be working on the movie and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, can you just come over and do all of these voice lines for us? just seems unworkable to me. Which may be why he says in his experience only two Hollywood actors could even keep up with their voice acting counterparts, those being Mark Hamill and Hayley Osmond. And it seems like many, many other developers and voice actors are all agreeing in this comment. And obviously there is a conflict of interest there as they don't want major Hollywood actors coming over and taking their jobs. But at the same time, I don't think this makes sense for numerous reasons. And for me, I think it's probably James Gunn not understanding the actual work involved, and so he just came out and said it. I think there's a tendency in Hollywood to think that they're the peak entertainment, that movie is what everyone wants to move up to. And they just see gaming as this sort of 
fringe little thing over there that we don't really need to put much work in. It's just a money tree for us. It's something we can do, but I'm sure it won't take much effort to entertain the children that play those video games. It's definitely a medium that they frown upon, and so uh, I think he's drastically underestimated the effort that would be required. Next up, we got a lot of information about various different first-person shooters this week, starting with Warzone 2 revealing its new resurgence map in Ashika. Previously leaked all the way back in December, it is now official, and will return as a resurgence map and also take part in DMZ starting on February the 15th. The DMZ part being a special usual, given how in Warzone 1 these things were entirely separate, but not in this, as you will actually be able to use it as an infiltration option. As someone that likes variety in these things, I think more maps being available for more modes is good, as long as you can choose what you want to do. I never like Vedance being removed from the original game because you got left with a map that you may not like and then removing one that you might have enjoyed. But as long as they do things like this which add to the game and don't take away from it, I'm all for it. For me, it's all about player choice. They should allow you to choose the map and the mode that you enjoy being on the most and not have to sit through all the crap. And in other more quickfire FPS news, we get Fortnite coming out with files which actually has a first person mode added into it. Now I much prefer first person over third in basically any shooter, so I think this is a great addition. I think it makes far more sense to go this way around and make a first person mode than it does for Call of Duty to go out and make a third person one. We also get Back for Blood being signed off by the developer, it's not going to get any new content, with the studio moving on to its next game. We just don't have the people to continue working on Back for Blood as we spin up another game, so it's time for us to put our heads down and get working on the next big thing. Now, quite frankly, I'm sure they would have continued working on Back for Blood if it was still monetarily successful. Obviously, you can always hire more staff, so if it had continued to be profitable, they would have continued to work on it. But Back for Blood always had a bit of a rough start and required a lot of work to even get it playable again. Their whole cards idea and even the zombie spawn system wasn't in great shape at launch. And I much prefer the current state of it than it was at launch. It's vastly improved. I think the issue they'll always have is sort of living in Left 4 Dead shadow and Back for Blood just didn't really compete or even have that kind of replayability factor that Left 4 Dead did. So while Back for Blood has gone on to receive three different expansion packs in its time, it was only launched in October 2021 and they're already moving on to their next game, so I imagine it was a disappointment for the studio, or at the very least, didn't have the legs that they were hoping for. We get more FPS changes with Overwatch 2 moving into Season 3, with developers saying the ranked mode suffered from poor comprehension, in other words, they did it terribly, but they are at least listening to players when they say the game doesn't feel rewarding enough, players can't earn the items that they need, so they will at least be making changes about monetization in Overwatch, as well as changing alt costs, and looking into various terrible mechanics such as one-shots in the game. You walk around a corner and immediately die, it's hardly a skill mechanic, is it? I don't understand why players are annoyed at that. Generally, when you play an FPS, the fun comes from actually shooting people back. And Overwatch isn't the only IP going through massive changes when we've got Halo basically starting from scratch with an entirely new engine for the next game. I think considering the horror that was the last game where even hit detection was just out of this world, Starting with a game meant for FPS is definitely for the best. It started off as a battle royale, but may evolve into different directions. Which, considering when anyone even suggested a battle royale for the last Halo game, they got their heads bitten off. It is a bit of a brave strategy to just be basing your entire new shooter on it. The report suggests that further Halo games may also be developed on Unreal, which for me is just common sense, but I can't help wondering if they're concentrating solely on a BR now, whether they've just missed that boat entirely. As we've seen with Warzone, BRs can drastically improve your IP if they're done in concert with a multiplayer game. You manage to combine that paid component of a single player game and an arena shooter alongside a free BR which filters people into your paid game. Combine that with battle passes and everything else and you have a great value proposition for everyone. And yet Halo seems to be doing it piecemeal and releasing it all years apart. And I'm just not sure that'll have the same impact with customers as the Call of Duty model does. Now, have you ever been playing a Witcher game and wish you could just invite a friend along to help you out with one of those quests? Because that could soon be a reality in a co-op Witcher game in the works, as Molasses Flood is after a developer with co-op and multiplayer experience. The team behind the new Witcher game, codenamed Project Sirius, has posted a job listing looking for a senior multiplayer designer primarily after someone with an experience developing PvE games. And Molasses Flood themselves is a game designer with experience in co-op games. And obviously, if you're making something which is PvE, but you also want someone with multiplayer experience, you're really only left with co-op as an option. Now, whether that turns out to be a single-player game with a co-op person to help join you on the quests, or a sort of Back for Blood style, your team versus a horde of enemies, who knows? What we do know, though, is this is definitely not Witcher 4. And CG Project have stated, that this is going to be a whole new departure from the Witcher series that we currently know. But for now, that's it from me. If you liked the video, press like, subscribe. More videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.